Welcome to the Covidence UK webinar for March 2022. My name's Adrian Martineau. I'm the Chief Investigator of the Covidence UK study based at Queen Mary University of London. So in today's webinar, I want to cover two questions. The first is why stick with Covidence UK? And the second relates to what the impact of COVID-19 has been on our household finances. So in terms of the first question, uh, all of us will know, of course, that the last month has seen major changes in terms of public health policy in the UK. Um, shortly after the last questionnaire came out, um, COVID self-isolation was scrapped and free tests uh, will end on the 1st of April. Um, more recently, you'll also be aware that all COVID travel restrictions have been scrapped uh, in a boost for the Easter holidays. Now, of course, all of this is cause for celebration, but I wouldn't want you to go away with the impression that uh, COVID-19 has gone away entirely. Um, first of all, let me just show you the latest statistics uh, showing that uh, in the last week or two, uh, in line with relaxation of a lot of the restrictions we've been living under, um, COVID numbers have started to increase. And Sajid Javid himself has advised that Britons should brace themselves for rising COVID cases. And although, of course, for uh, many of us, um, COVID-19 infection, particularly with one of the new milder variants, uh, is a relatively mild illness, uh, we must remember that for clinically extremely vulnerable people who have problems with their immune system or other underlying conditions, COVID-19 represents a real threat to health and that is ongoing. A second thing we must bear in mind is that uh, government funding for COVID tracking research has been cut in line with the latest relaxations. Um, and this means that we now have reduced surveillance for uh, COVID tracking uh, across the UK. Now, one of the big advantages of COVID in UK is that we're independently funded. And so that allows us to continue to monitor new infections, vaccine efficacy and impacts of COVID-19 in the UK population. One good example of the work that we've done recently uh, on looking at the impacts of COVID-19 was publicised in The Guardian uh, last week on the 9th of March, um, which highlighted new work that was coordinated uh, done by Anne Williamson here at Queen Mary University of London, who's a health economist in our team, who's been looking at data from the covid UK study, which examines the link between testing positive for COVID-19 and subsequent economic hardship. Uh, and Anne is joining us on the webinar today to present her work. So Anne, over to you. Great, thanks very much, Adrian, and really pleased to be joining you here to talk about this exciting work. Uh, as, as explained, I'm a health economist and I'm particularly interested in the relationship between disease and economic vulnerability, which is something that we've worked on using the covid uh, data set. So this project, uh, titled The Acute and Long-Term Impacts of COVID on Economic Vulnerability, has just uh, delivered some results. What were we looking into here? Well, it's widely known that there is a link between poverty and exposure or risk of COVID-19, both becoming infected and the severity of infection. There were a few routes to this identified by other um, academics and research previously. So we know that people who were poor were more exposed to the disease through their occupational exposure, continuing to travel particularly early on in the pandemic. There's also social and environmental exposure, the living environment, for instance, of people in particularly crowded spaces and increased vulnerability due to underlying comorbidities that were already associated with lower socioeconomic backgrounds. These relationships or um, increased risk continued even in the vaccination era, as some research by others on the Covidence project has shown. So this problem hadn't gone away. But what we were interested in here was not just the direction of risk or causality from poverty to infection, but whether the reverse also existed, whether those who became sick with COVID-19 were at greater risk at ending up in greater poverty um, at the end of the pandemic. To investigate this, we conducted a long-term follow-up study looking at the impact of COVID on the adequacy of household income 
and also the uh, risk of being absent from work due to sickness, one of the key routes that people could find themselves economically vulnerable. The reason this is an interesting question or one that required such comprehensive set of data is because lots of people ended the pandemic poorer, whether or not they were infected with COVID. So what we tried to tease out here was whether there was an increased risk for those with infection relative to everyone else who was in a similar circumstance who can who perhaps was at a greater risk of poverty anyway. So we focused in on the change that came when someone was infected, controlling for their baseline, their initial economic state or the economic vulnerability they would have had whether or not they'd been infected with the disease. How did we go about this? Well, using the COVID uh, participant database, we looked at 16,910 participants who hadn't previously had COVID at the time of enrolment, so we could look at a change at the time of infection. Of these 16,910, there were just over a thousand who did test po positive at some point during the pandemic. There were uh, almost 50% of the total sample who did at some point report inadequate household income. And there was a smaller but significant number who reported at least once being absent from work due to sickness. So we considered these and we looked at the relationship between these different variables. What did we find? Well, there were a few key findings. Uh, in general, we conducted this regression analysis, so a statistical analysis, uh, controlling four different variables to see whether those who got COVID were at a greater risk of insufficient income. And there are lots of numbers at play, but the key finding here is that there was a significantly increased odds of becoming of developing insufficient income during the follow-up period both acutely so in the month following a reported positive COVID test where here we see this 1.39 uh, odds ratio which means a 39 percent increased risk of COVID um, of COVID leading to insufficient income for the family in that month and then on the long term we saw that that effect persisted so someone gets COVID they are at greater risk of not being able to meet their basic needs to pay for food, transport and sort of heating for their family in the following month, but also that that continue to kind of plague them throughout the pandemic. And remember, this is over and above the general economic vulnerability that everyone was experiencing through this period. So this is alarming from a general inequality perspective because people who were poorer or more likely to get sick, but also those who got sick were more likely to become or stay poor. And note there, I say this is after adjusting for a range of characteristics, including their baseline economic status. Then the second question we look at was whether this occurred equally across all people with infection or whether we saw what's called a dose response re relationship, namely those who were sicker may have had an even worse economic outcome than those who had COVID but were relatively less sick. So what we looked at here was whether those who described having long COVID ended up more economically vulnerable than those who had COVID but no long COVID. And again, we saw that effect borne out. So here in the long term, there was a small increase in risk of insufficient income for those who didn't have long COVID but had a COVID test, but a much bigger relationship for those who did have long COVID. And we can assess the significance of the trend here, which has a, um, a, a very significant value. So what this means is the sicker you were, the greater your economic risk, which suggests that there's a clear relationship here. There's a causal relationship from disease to economic vulnerability. What's the bottom line of these findings? Well, to summarise again, we found that COVID independently increased the risk of insufficient household income in the short term and the long term. This effect was stronger for those with long COVID or those who were hospitalised with COVID, another aspect we look at in the paper. And then in further analysis with details I haven't gone into here, we also found an increased risk of sickness absence in the long term. Although interestingly, that sickness absence risk took longer to play out, which suggests that in the short term, the hit to people's economic situation 
wasn't just through employment. There may have been other things at play. For instance, increased health-related costs when they first were sick with COVID. And then over the long term, the economic cost comes through this, uh, this employment route as well. What do we do with these findings? What happens next? Well, I think first, it's important to think of this as a vicious cycle that if sickness leads to poverty and poverty increases the risk of sickness, people can end up trapped in a downward spiral, which we have to take seriously, pay attention to and build into our understanding of the costs and the risks of the COVID pandemic that people have lived through. But also it informs our actions because if this cycle exists, it's not set in stone. If you intervene effectively early on and in a decisive way, we can break this circuit. So particularly what this information empowers us to do is circuit breaker interventions that aren't just medical. Imagine, for instance, someone is hospitalised with COVID. They're at risk of this downward spiral into economic vulnerability. But in the follow up that they go home with, they're not just followed up for their respiratory capacity, the kind of breathing recovery, but also they're linked into social support or job seeking support to check whether they've been able to go back to work and assist if they haven't been able to do so in the way they were before. If that support comes at the right time, they never get into this downward spiral, protecting them, their family, their community, and also saving significant costs in the long run. Thirdly, I think there may be other epidemics of inequality with diseases that come on in this sort of way. If, for instance, someone was infected by tuberculosis or diabetes, we should be asking whether these relationships develop, if they're similar to COVID or if they play out differently, there's a lot of further research to be done. So this is an important finding, an alarming one for the well-being of lots of people across the nation, but also one that can really drive us to important and transformative action. So thanks very much to a lot of people in making this possible, but first and foremost to all the study participants. This couldn't have been done without your ongoing uh, participation in Covidence UK because it's the long-term nature of the data that let us make these findings. Also, thanks to... Um, my co-authors, so that was Florence Tideman uh, at Queen Mary, Alec Miners at the London School of Hygiene, and Adrian, my fellow presenter on uh, this, this webinar today. Uh, and we also had Kate Piper at the University of Strathclyde. So we had lots of really valuable input there, uh, but it's a huge thanks to Covidence for making it possible. Thanks to Hayley and to the entire team. That's great. Thank you very much, Annie, for a really uh, clear presentation. And I hope it provides you all with a bit of a break from the immunology that you've become used to over the last uh, few months. So uh, I just want to finish by adding my thanks to those of Annie. Um, please keep on providing us with your data, the monthly questionnaires. It's extremely valuable and I look forward to catching up with you next month. Goodbye. <laughs>